Okay, you can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 18. We're finally back on the study of the uh, Revelation for Bible-believing Christians uh, studies. So we're going to start out here with verse 1. Revelation 18, verse 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, I'm not going to do a big study on this thing here. I'm going to show you a verse that ties in with this. But in your King James Bible, angels are called stars many times. Let me show you a good example of it. Revelation chapter 9. Go back to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. It says here, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So a star falls to earth, and to him is given the key of the bottomless pit. And there are many, many other places we could go to. Like I said, we're not going to, because that's not the purpose of this study. But um, it's an interesting thing that stars, uh, you know, angels are called in the Old Testament, they're called morning stars. Jesus is the bright and morning star. So it's kind of an interesting thing. It gives some new perspective when you go outside at night and you look up at the stars in the sky. Very interesting. I find it interesting, too, that uh, Satan, as he always tries to pervert things, uh, he has Hollywood stars in the city of angels. You know, Los Angeles. In Spanish for the angels. Kind of an interesting thing there. Verse 2, Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Hmm. Again, some more of the symbology in the scripture here. Uh, devils are basically symbolized by winged things like little insects or even birds. I'll show you an interesting thing here. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Go back to the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And uh, verse 20. It says here, Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bed bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Very interesting there. Uh, the Bible talks about familiar spirits. Um, there is the spirit realm all around us. And um, we can't see it. But you can liken things to uh, things with wings. That's why you got to be real careful when you hear these people talking about, I saw angel wings or something like this. Angels don't have wings in the Bible. You know, I hear this stuff, you know, I, well, I was in this car accident and I saw wings go past my window. It was like bright and I saw these wings going by and things. Well, then you probably saw a devil. Not one place in the whole, whole King James Bible. Not one reference to angels having wings. Cherubim and seraphim, yes. Angels, no. They're never said to have wings. But birds have wings. You go back to Revelation 18. And uh, mosquitoes, blood-sucking mosquitoes and other flies and things like that, they have wings. Again, big study, very interesting study there. Verse 3. And again, if you you know watch the last study, we were talking about Revelation chapter 17. This Babylon, mystery Babylon, is Roman Catholicism without a doubt. I'm going to show you further proof on this thing. Uh, but Revelation chapter 18, verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, where people make a big mistake is they say, well, see, this is talking about this city. So the city, in this context of this passage here, it's talking about basically dealings with like a seaport, essentially. And they're like, wait, that can't be the Vatican. But it's not talking specifically about everything happening with this one city geographically. It's talking about the city ruling over the kings of the earth just like Roman Catholicism does. How do, how do they rule over the earth? Through Catholic knighthoods, the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of uh, the Equestrian Order, all these different Catholic knighthoods. Um, they, they, all the time, they'll, you can either join them or they'll, give, they'll confer special ones, Knight of 
St. Gregory the Great or something like this. I think Rupert Murdoch, the owner of Fox uh, Television Network, and HarperCollins, which owns Zondervan, produces the NIV, and the Satanic Bible. Again, you can look that up. Um, but he was given this uh, knighthood of the, I think, St. Gregory the Great or something like this. So you can join fraternal organizations like the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of Malta, the Knights Templar, you know, Knights of the Equestrian Order. But then there's also special knighthoods given. And this is what the Vatican does to control all the different nations of the world. Um, then they also have their military arm, the Jesuit Order. And again, these guys, Jesuit trained politicians, lawyers, whatever. They're in all different organizations out there. And you have a whole bunch of other Catholic uh, organizations and things too. But they're the ones that are controlling the world. So it's a mistake to think Revelation 18 is just talking about a city that's doing all the, you know, selling, buying and selling of goods all over the world and it's all being done at that city. No, it's talking about the city ruling over all the nations and they're the ones that are doing all the trading and the city is overseeing the whole thing. All right? And you can trace it back to the Vatican. All right, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Now you can look at that thing two ways. Okay? Come out of her, my people. Is that true for today? Well, a lot of people get into the Protestant type of system and things like that. Um, the Protestant denominations are all daughters of the harlot. You can read about that over in Revelation 17, verse 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The Protestants, those Protestant churches, all they did is they protested abuses that Rome was doing through the indulgences mostly and a lot of the other things that were, doing, that were going on. But they didn't say let's overthrow Catholicism. They said let's just reform it. So they protested and Catholicism, abuses of Catholicism and sought to reform Catholicism. They didn't just say, hey, no thank you. Bible-believing Christians during that time period were just on the outside of that whole thing and were called just heretics, heretical cults or sects or things like that. Um, Bible-believing Christians are not, our heritage is not the Protestant system. Now, we've benefited from some things within the Protestant Reformation. I will say that, certainly. Uh, the King James Bible came, I don't even give, I don't want to give the Protestant Reformation credit for it, but because it's the Lord that set the whole thing up, we'll give the Lord credit. But uh, it was the Protestants that, you know, helped to bring this thing about. Certainly, God used the Protestants. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, there's been other things that the Protestant system has done that was good. But now, if you notice, all the Protestants have gone back to Rome. You look at the hierarchy, I'm not saying that every boy that calls himself a Protestant is a Roman Catholic or something. Of course not. There are still some people that have you know, Protestant labels upon them, and they are not for Catholicism. But you go up to the hierarchies of the Pro or the uh, Presbyterians or the Lutherans or the Methodists or the Episcopalians or whatever other classic Protestant uh, churches out there, denominations, they're all in bed with the Vatican. Okay? That's the first way. All right? Now, that would be instruction in righteousness for today because... You know, in the future, the time of Jacob's trouble, um, I think most of the Protestant, you know, denominations are going to be fully, just completely Catholic. I think they're going to be just dissolved and going to be Catholic. Like Tony Palmer said with uh, Kenneth Copeland's little Pentecostal meeting thing that they had there. I did a video on that whole thing years ago. And Tony Palmer said, he said, maybe we're just all Catholics now. You know, you know the Lutheran... You know, church has rejoined Rome and, and the Protestants' Reformation is over. Maybe we're just all Catholics. Kind of jumped the gun a little bit. So they either killed him, you know, his motorcycle crash, or he just, they faked his death and whatever else. Again, that's a whole other issue, but we won't get into that. But the second way that you can look at this, you could say, come out of her, my people, Protestants. Okay? But the second way, and I think this is the more accurate way, uh, way to look at this thing, what's going on in this time period is that the Jews, I talked about the third temple, the Jewish thing there, and the Antichrist comes and he confirms the covenant. He doesn't make a peace treaty. 
Again, I don't know where on earth that whole teaching came from. I've believed it for years, but then you start examining, you go, wait a second. It doesn't say anything about a peace treaty between Jews and Muslims. It doesn't say anything of the kind. He confirms the covenant. The covenant's already there. He confirms it. Right? And the covenant, I believe, is going to be between Roman Catholicism and the Zionist Jewish movement. That's what I believe it's going to be between. So, in light of that, thinking... Here in Revelation chapter 18, the Lord says, Hey, my people, the Jewish people that he has a covenant with there, seed of Abraham, he says, Come out of her, Roman Catholicism, my people, the Jews. I think that's the more accurate way to look at the thing. Why? Well, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and, and that ye receive not of her plagues. If you're Jewish and you go into that time of Jacob's trouble, uh, don't yoke up with Catholicism even if it's the law and whatever else. You better run from them. It's going to be pretty important. But let's continue. Uh, verse 5, Revelation 18, verse 5. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Her sins have reached unto heaven. Hmm. What does that mean? How, how do sins reach unto heaven? Let's go back to the first reference of that in the entire Bible, Genesis chapter 11. The specific thing there, the specific wording about reaching unto heaven. Genesis chapter 11, we're going to read the first nine verses here. You're going to see the very first New World Order. It's kind of interesting. The very first one starts in Babylon, and it ends up with Mystery Babylon. Okay, Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. They have reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered ab abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Okay, now let me just stop there for a minute. Um, isn't this what they're trying to do right now? Mm -hmm. They're going to have a city that reigns over the kings of the earth. And it's been doing that for a while, but... They're getting more and more and more power to the point where they're just going to openly come out and say, yeah, Catholic or die. Or you can confirm, you know, be Jewish and we'll confirm a covenant with you. But uh, it's coming. More and more people are coming out and saying that they're Christian now. And then they start talking about the saints and about the, the Holy Church and stuff. And you're going, uh-oh, Catholicism is coming to power openly again. They've been in power now for a long time. But the point is, they're going to be coming out more and more openly. But this is what they're trying to do. World government. Through the Babylonian system. And uh, don't tell me that America, you know, it's what, not even 300 years old? Three, you know, yeah, not even 300 years old? And America is the great Babylon, the great, and things like this. Reigns over the kings of the earth. <laughs> Please. Oh, please, give me a break. Verse 6, And the Lord God said, or excuse me, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Let me just stop there again. Integration. Oh, it's what a, what a terror. You, you're speaking against integration? Yes, I am. Why? Because of verse 6 right here. The people, when they say, We're all one. We're all one. Let's put aside our differences. That goes against God's created order. And if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you better get a hold of that thing, and you better stand for the Word of God. And it's going to fly right in the face of all this politically correct nonsense. It doesn't mean that you have to be some kind of a racist whatever that hates other people that are not of your particular ethnicity or whatever. No, no, that's not it. That's me. That's it's it's us saying as Christians. Me, I've said it in other studies is what I was going to say there, but saying I'm different than you and I want to stay different than you and I want you to stay different than me. So, segregation. 
See? How do you reconcile this? All these people with this integration stuff, you know, is so wonderful and everything else, and interracial marriage and everything, and, and they just, what do you do with this? You know? How do you get all the, you know, how do you get the Antichrist kingdom to come in? By getting everybody together or by keeping them separate? Some people just don't get it, though. You'd rather side, you know, side with the uh, modern politically correct world than you would with the Word of God. It's not very popular to side, to side with this book, but you better do it if you're saved. Verse 7, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. The Lord split them up. He didn't say, everybody come together. Let's just put aside our different... Split up. Go that way, go that way, go that way. And he still wants that for today. Don't give me this thing of, well, that's just Old Testament and things like this. It's Old Testament, but it's before the law, number one. So the things that are before the law are still binding on us today. As far as uh, you know, some of the things that the Lord said here in Genesis, you know, before Moses showed up in the law and things. Um, but secondly, it lines up perfectly with Acts chapter 17. So you can't escape it. Verse 6. I just find it interesting. Go back to uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse 6. I just find it so interesting that how things go in a circle. You know, it starts out world government, Babylonian system, Semiramis, Nimrod, their son Tammuz, who later became the husband of his own mother, you know, Semiramis. And that whole system, here we are at the end of, you know, the 6,000 year approximate 6,000 year time period of man's time on the earth. And here we are right back to the same thing again. Isn't that something? But let's continue. Verse 6, Revelation 18, verse 6. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Go over to Revelation 17. We'll see about this thing here. Verses 4 through 6. And the woman, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Show me one other system out there where you have a church symbolized as a woman, Holy Mother Church, they call it that themselves, the Queen of Heaven, you know, Mary and things like this, and they hold a golden cup in their hands that they say is blood and you're supposed to drink it. Show me that with Islam. Show me that with America. Show me that with Israel. Nobody else does it. I mean, you read Revelation 17, Revelation 18, you're going, Bible-believing Christian, you're going to look and say, it's Rome, it's Vatican, it's Roman Catholicism, it has to be. Nothing else fits this system. But the Catholics come out and they say, well, you know, this is just poetic and things. It was just, it was fulfilled in the first century. Um, um, it's America. Uh, 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 it's the Jews. It's because it's just plain as day that it's pointed right at them, the Catholics. But let's continue. Revelation 17, verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. She's got that golden cup in her hands, and yet she's drunken. You know, she claims that it's the it's this grape wine in here has been, you know, magically altered through uh, transubstantiation into the actual blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what they teach. That's not me making that up. They actually teach it's real blood. And they got that. So every Catholic goes to Mass, they're drinking blood in their mind. If they go up to the priest and say, that's not real blood, that's heresy. Okay? They believe that they're drinking blood, and the blood of Jesus Christ, nonetheless. Real fine thing to do there. You know, the blood shed on the cross to pay for your sins. Oh no, we have to be there drinking it. I mean, a disgusting picture when you think about it. You have Jesus there dying on the cross, 
Catholics, I guess, if they were good Catholics, if they could be transported back in time in a time machine, they'd be going over there and lick, licking the blood up off the ground. Over there, you know, taking bites of his flesh off and stuff and drinking some of the blood that's coming out of him. That's what they believe for their salvation. If you're a Catholic, that's what you believe. If you had access to Christ's physical body and his physical blood, you would eat it and drink it, wouldn't you? You say, well, no, no, because we, we do it through the, the, you know, the wafer and the wine and stuff like this. But you're teaching that that's the real thing. Satanic corrupt system. But they've been made drunk with killing martyrs and saints of Jesus Christ. And I, I have no idea. I've heard numbers of like 10 million, you know, Christians down through the years have been killed by Roman Catholicism. I don't think that there's any way to accurately know the actual number that the Catholics have killed uh, through the Inquisition, through the Dark Ages, through just wars and death and just all. It, it's horrifying what the Catholics have done. It's terrible. But here's the really important thing if you're a Catholic that you need to get. Verse 6, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. You know what the Bible's saying here? Let's just say, we'll figure low. The Catholics have slaughtered, up in Revelation 17, verse 6, the blood of the saints and martyrs, 10 million. Okay? Let's go with 10 million. Then that means, over here in chapter 18, verse 6, that means that there's going to be 20 million Catholics killed in the time of Jacob's trouble. 10 million over here, Revelation 17, 6. Revelation 18, 6. You have to have double the amount of Catholics killed. Payback time. And God's the one doing it. Not Christians, not militant, Bible-believing, whatever, whatever. I couldn't kill 20 million Catholics, even if I wanted to, and I don't want to. You know, but God has it prophesied in his word. It's going to be something else. Verse 7, another clue to who uh, this is talking about, Revelation 18 and 17 are talking about. Verse 7 here, How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, now get a hold of this one, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Another ex just absolute proof that it's Roman Catholicism. Can't be anybody else. Why? She sits a queen. The woman rides the beast, you see. Roman Catholicism, Holy Mother Church, is the one that controls the Antichrist and that whole political system. She sits as a queen. But yet she's no widow. What does that mean? She's not married. It's not that she's a queen and that she's ruling as a queen because the king died. No, no, no. She sits as a queen and she's not a widow. She's a single woman. Almost like a whole organization, church organization that's a celibate. Uh, again, are the Jews celibate? No. Muslims celibate? No. What about the America? I don't think so. What organization, religious organization, is filled with celibate priests, nuns, pope, archbishop, cardinal, blah, 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 blah? Only one system can fulfill Revelation 18, verse 7, and that's Roman Catholicism. I'll show you the good tie in Scripture with this. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I mean, when you're honest, there's there's just no way to get around this, you know. Unless you're in bed with the Vatican yourself, there's just no way that you can interpret these scriptures any other way. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Not Catholicism. I never do that. Yeah. Verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. How can you rape children and call yourself a holy priest and father so-and-so and have people come to you, oh, father, they're confessing their sins to you and you just got done molesting some child not long ago? 
and it's epidemic. Don't even give me this thing of what it happens rarely in the Catholic Church. It's an epidemic, okay? And it's purposeful as well, by the way. Let me just say that. It's called satanic ritual abuse. It is part of the whole Luciferian agenda and things, and the, you know, get into all this stuff, trans Ugothian magic and all this all this other stuff, and, and you know, gaining eternal life by sodomizing young boys or girls and things. It, it, you people, I understand the system, okay? You're sick, disgusting perverts. And I had a brother send me an article, and it, it's this thing of these Catholics now. They've been coming out, and the, and the children are coming forward saying, yeah, the, you know, the priest raped me and stuff. And um, and the, the priests are saying, well, yes, but the child went with me into the woods where they were molested. So technically it was with consent. <laughs> I mean, disgusting. The Catholics are going to get to the point, and you mark my words, give you a little prophecy, the Catholic hierarchy will get to the point where pedophilia will be legalized. They will get to that point. It's disgusting. It's sick. It's gruesome. And again, I saw some guy, uh, Craig Solman Sawyer. Uh, he's a special ops guy and whatever else. And, uh, you know, I guess he's ex-Navy SEAL and things like this. And he's got this organization where they're going out, going after child molesters and stuff like this. And the guy's a Catholic. You know, he's got videos on his channel, him in a, him in a Catholic church, and I guess he's, his daughter's there doing singing recitals and stuff, and I'm going, <laughs> okay, you're going to go after pedophiles, but you're part of the biggest pedophile network in the entire world. Explain that to me. It's called gatekeeping, brethren, is what it's called. It's called these guys are going out and they're eliminating competition. People that are not part of their system, that are out molesting children and raping children, well, they'll go after them. It's kind of like the CIA drug ops thing. You know, CIA through black ops, they go out and they deal with drugs and stuff and they get things. And the only ones that they're busting are the ones that are not part of their system. You don't want to create a monopoly on the system so that you can make all the money yourself. It, it just, this, this world is just so disgusting. It just makes me sick. But they sear their conscience with a hot iron. And then go out there and act like a holy man and with their little robes on and all the stuff, these Catholic priests and the Pope and everything else. And let me tell you something, to get to the level of Pope, you got to do some really, really sick stuff. And again, I've heard accounts and things and whatever else, I'm not going to get into it. It's just disgusting what these priests and these men do to get to be Pope. They're sick individuals, very, very sick individuals. And so when God's wrath comes, it is well deserved. Believe you me. But let's continue here. Look at verse 3. Speaking of this group that sear their conscience with a hot iron. Look at this. Forbidding to marry. Celibacy. It isn't, uh, well, you don't have to marry. You know, just stay single like Paul did. No, no. They're forbidden to marry. Celibacy. Forced celibacy. And commanding to abstain from meats, which the Catholics also do. They also do the same thing. Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Yep. So there you go. Celibacy. People that sear their conscience with a hot iron. Direct correlation to what's going on back there in Revelation 18. Which you can go back to. Revelation 18, we're going to go to verse 8. Okay. It says here, uh, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Yeah. yeah it's interesting because uh, last October, um, the my wife's birth is, birthday is on the 21st of October, and, and I remember I was giving her a hard time because I said, you know, I wonder what the Lord's going to give you for your birthday and things. And a few days later, there was this huge big earthquake in Narcia, Italy, and this uh, really old uh, basilica or something like that, you know, just flattening. I mean, just all these Catholics, you know, just, just all this Catholic stuff, you know, just destroyed and everything. I was like, well, there you go. Happy birthday <laughs> you know, from the Lord. You're laughing about that. And, you know, you go, oh, how dare you laugh? There's, there were civilians that got hurt. Um, I will take great joy when I see Roman Catholic structures being brought down because that's where the children are being raped at. That's where things are happening. Okay. Um, when I see Catholic cathedrals and things like that being brought down, I will joy. I will jump up and down 
and be happy about it because that means less children being defiled in those places. Less people having being wrecked and, and going to hell. You know, and Christians have this really weird notion of things. I'm going to be doing a study on this in the future. The thing of when you see God's judgment and wrath coming upon an area, you know, through natural disasters or whatever else, you know, an act of God, they even call it that. Um, when you see that, be careful about your reaction. You know, you can become very worldly all of a sudden and say, oh, the, the, you know, I just had such a human tragedy. Oh, those poor people down in Houston. Oh, those poor people. Um, what were they doing? Are they accepting of the whole transgender sodomite movement down there? Well, yeah, but, you know, then they deserved what they got. I mean, would you have wept tears over Sodom and Gomorrah when God rained fire and brimstone down on it? So, look at the human tragedy. Let's take up a collection. Why? Now, you know, should Christians help in situations like that? Sure, but uh, make sure that the gospel's there. All right? I'm not saying that everybody that got hit with Hurricane Harvey down there in Texas or the one that's coming, that's Irma that's coming here, you know, possibly September the 11th, I'm not saying that everybody's just all guilty, wicked, sodomite, pervert, pedophiles or something. I'm not saying that. I understand that there's innocent, you know, quote-unquote innocent people. I mean, I've seen Christians that'll go through stuff like that. I remember seeing this thing the one time. Some hurricane hit some place, and it was like all the houses are smashed, and there's like one house it's totally standing. And uh, Sister in the Lord did some, she was like, I saw that picture. She's like, I had to find out. Did some research. People that were at that house that was totally spared, we're saved. And it's like, hmm, interesting. But, you know, the Lord will deliver the godly out of stuff like that and things. But you have some of these really wicked cities, and Christians are just like, okay, I'm out of here. I'm getting out of this place. And you should, by the way. I think Christians should be getting out of these cities. They're wicked. But you see this type of thing, a natural disaster hits it. God punishes the wicked. I mean, What's worse, for God to do that or for God to let him just keep going on and on and on until, you know, pedophilia is, is legalized in that city and now you can have little children being raped and molested legally and the police aren't allowed to do anything about it. We've got to get our priorities right, brethren. We've got to stand by this book no matter how unpopular it makes us. And I see a lot of the brethren professing brethren and some that are just carnal and they don't want to stand by the book. The book uh, makes them look bad when the book talks about slavery and the book talks about integration and things like that and God's judgment and wrath coming upon people that reject him. All of a sudden you just get kind of quiet and, um, uh, and you have to start making excuses for the Bible. Be real careful about that. So, you know, we're kind of excited for my wife's birthday coming up here, you know, and things, just to see uh, what the Lord has planned this year. So, uh, we have our hopes, you know. But to go back to Jeremiah chapter 23, I mean, we don't, you know, we don't have to have another basilica come down or anything like that, but maybe a Catholic seminary or you know, Georgetown University would be a good one. I'd like to see that be brought down in an earthquake. So, uh, you know. Jeremiah chapter 23. Verse 29. You know, say this real quick here. Just Revelation 18, um, verse 8. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Hmm. Interesting little tie in there. And, you know, this last this big earthquake in Narcia, it put cracks in St. Peter's Basilica. Hmm. And God's word is like a fire. And Mystery Babylon is going to be destroyed by fire. 
And the Bible says it's also like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Hmm. Interesting. What's the foundation of the Catholic Church again? Peter the uh, Rock? No tie-ins there, I'm sure. Verses 9 through 10, Revelation 18. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Again, the kings of the earth are subservient to her. You see that there. All these rulers and things like that, they're subservient to the Vatican. That's why they have to travel there and go in to have an audience with the Pope. Verse 10, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Okay, these kings are standing afar off. Again, people are coming out with this interpretation. Revelation 18 is this city, and it's a seaport. All the kings are right there. They're whatever. No, 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 no. It's they are being controlled by a specific city that is overseeing all the trading and wealth distribution and all that other stuff. And of course, when you hit the, the time of Jacob's trouble with the Mark of the Beast system, it's going to be completely controlled by the Vatican. I mean, I saw something here just yesterday, I think it was, where they were talking about uh, Venezuela, I think it was, and all this financial problems and stuff down there. And they were like, we, you know, they can't print cash quick enough. And the only way to really buy stuff is with your little ATM card, your debit card. And then they're putting limits on that and things. Do you think that those people are ready to take the mark of the beast? Hey, here's this thing comes along, implant a microchip in your hand, and we'll even give you $10,000 credit. Hmm. Get rid of that cash. That cash isn't any good anymore. Do you think they're ready for it? Ready, willing, and able. Saw uh, there was an older man. Saw this in, in a news thing on this prophecy update deal yesterday, and there was an older man, and all he could buy was uh, some bananas, and I, I forget what else it was, you know, and that's all he could buy. You know, worked hard, retired, pension, and all that other stuff, and he couldn't get enough money to, to buy more than just a, a thing of bananas and a little bit of, I think it was coffee or something like that. Yeah, it's getting real all over the country, all over the world, you know. I mean, in America, it's it's crazy, too. I mean, most people don't pay cash for anything anymore. And the financial systems are, are just, you know, just collapsing and falling, and you're trying to patch the thing up and all this other stuff. The Vatican come out and say, hey, we got this new system. Take the mark. Worship our Savior here, our Christ. And uh, you get just... You can go anywhere. There's no more currency problems of going between countries and things like that. It's all one currency now. The people are as one. You see? Absolutely incredible. Verse 11. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. So, again... Um, they're not buying merchandise anymore, all right? And why? Well, because the Vatican has, you know, this whole world banking system. And, and again, you know, I, I saw a thing on that. Uh, there's a, oh, I can't think of what her name is right now, but she was a former World Bank employee, and she basically said, and I'm, you know, I mean, Catherine something, is it Albrecht? Or, no, I forget what her name was. But she actually said that, uh, you know, that when she was in the World Bank, they basically, she said it was the Vatican and specifically the Jesuits that were controlling the, the pricing of gold and silver. And the pricing of gold and silver has just gone just crazy the last couple of years. It was going up and up and up and all of a sudden it was just like, boom, you know, and they just destroyed the price of it. And I had some silver back before we moved to Maine that I've been saving up for years and years, you know, because, oh, it's getting better and better and it's eventually going to be worth, you know, $800 an ounce or something crazy or whatever. And uh, it just was like, when I sold my silver, it was right around $46 an ounce. And it's going down, it's below 20 now. I think probably like last I looked, it was like $17 an ounce, you know. And 
I mean, I talked to the guys that have been dealing doing precious metal, dealing in precious metals all their lives, and one guy was an older man, probably in his 60s, and he's like, they're controlling it. He's like, I don't know who, who the they are, but he said, they're controlling this thing. They have to be. Um, it's the controlling the pricing and things. How do they do that? Well, they get enough of it into their own private stocks, and then they can control and manipulate the market. So, again, the Vatican. They're the ones that are behind this thing. And, of course, when the, the whole Mark of the Beast thing comes out, they're going to be the controllers of that whole system. That's why the kings of the earth, uh, the merchants of the earth, excuse me, verse 11, um, shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And, again, people have become so dependent on the monetary system and things like that. Again, people don't pay cash for things. You know, we've had this whole system of artificial money and things like that created so that people would become dependent upon it. I mean, when's the last time you bartered for something? Took some eggs that, you know, your chickens laid and, and went and traded for uh, a skein of yarn or something like that, you know. See what I'm saying? People are dependent in this time period. Let's continue reading here. Verses 12 through 14 in Revelation 18. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyan wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Don't think for one second that slavery is over. You're quite foolish. Um... And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things that were which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. Isn't that incredible? Again, people have, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication, the Vatican's fornication, this whole all this World Bank stuff and all the other things. And again, I can't get into all that stuff, you know, who's behind the banking institutions and whatever else. Not, I mean, there's just not enough time to get into all this stuff. But the whole point is, people have become so dependent on it that they don't even know how to barter anymore. They don't even know how to trade anymore. I mean, you read back through the Old Testament, they, you know, Abraham was quite wealthy, and he did have gold and silver and precious stones and things like that, but he also had, you know, oxen and asses, modern, you know, you'd say donkeys, and, you know, um, camels and, you know, silk and, you know, things like that. Real physical goods were wealth for thousands of years until the creation of, uh, you know, this stuff right here. And again, this is a whole other study. I'm not going to get into it here, but right there. Paper money is fake. I mean, you take this piece of paper here and you put one on it. And then you take another piece of paper. Just give me a minute here. Okay. This one has a 1 on it. This one has a 10 on it. What's the difference? They're the same size piece of paper. Exactly the same amount of paper. Now this one I know has some colored ink on it. This is just the green or whatever. But what's really the difference? In cost to the Federal Reserve, which is a private bank run for profit. It has nothing to do with the federal government, and it doesn't have any gold in reserves, uh, or not enough to cover the debts that they've, you know, loaned out, whatever. But think about it. What's the difference between the two in terms of cost to the Federal Reserve? Does this one really take $10 to make? No. Is this one a dollar to make? No. The value assigned to this is what's printed upon it. Now you take a gold coin, and I'm not going to be holding up any gold coins because you know, I don't exactly have uh, that kind of thing sitting around here, but you take a gold coin that's this big and one that's that big, okay? Is there a difference in the value? Yeah. What if you took the big gold coin, let's say it's a one ounce gold coin, we'll just say that. One ounce gold coin and you write one tenth on it. One tenth ounce. You take the one tenth ounce coin and you put one ounce on it. Could you deceive anybody? 
No. But you can do it with this. Paper money. So you get rid of the gold and the silver. Every country that had gold and silver and copper coins all got rid of them when they started printing the money. Every single one of them. Do the history book or the history work on it. And you'll see I'm right. They all got rid of gold and silver coins. Brought in cash. You inflate the economic system. Now all of a sudden people are driving around fancy cars, living in big huge houses and everything else. It's all inflated. It's illusion. That's the wine of her fornication. The world banking system fornicates with the different countries and says, hey, we're going to give you this power to print money and things like that. And they all cooperate together in things and exchange rates and all this other stuff until eventually the Vatican goes whoop and pulls the plug and they go, our cash is worthless. It's worthless. It's not worth anything. And you've already gotten the people so dependent on that artificially created wealth and the digital currency that's there now, where you don't even have to carry around paper money anymore, you got numbers in a computer. Now you got a little, uh, a little card, you know, a little card that you can carry around in your in your wallet, you know, and uh, that buys your things now. It's insane, and the mark of the beast comes out and. Now you got people already hooked on the system of fornication that the Vatican does with all these different governments and things. And they've, they've lost the ability to even trade. You know, all the, the list of things there in Revelation chapter 18, you know, cinnamon and thine wood and all this other stuff, you'd think that they could trade, have enough brains to say, let me trade you this, let me trade you that. It's not, I should say it this way, it's not that people don't have the brains to trade anymore, it's that people are too greedy to trade. That's the whole issue. People want that money. They love that money. Another little point I want to make here, verse 14. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. Another little interesting tie into the whole Hurricane Harvey thing. Those people just had everything just in so-so in order and everything else. And, and now it's just like floodwaters in their homes and everything's just rotted and they're taking stuff out, all their you know, good things that they had and throwing them in trash bags and putting them out in the front yard. Trash collector, come and get them. Hmm. It's really something. That's just, it's just minor compared to what's going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble. Let's continue reading, verses 15 through 19. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the cap company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the, re in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Um, <clears throat> and again, you know, these guys are, are lamenting the death of a financial system. You know, I mean, if a city gets destroyed and, you know, you just go to another city. I mean, again, I saw a thing, this uh, Dallas thing down, or no, Houston, excuse me, Houston. Um, there were a lot of people that left uh, Louisiana when the whole, um, uh, what was the name of the one in Louisiana that hit, I cannot think right now, the hurricane that hit there years ago. I keep thinking Hurricane Mitch, but that was the one that hit Honduras. Katrina, Hurricane Katrina. The... It got hit, you know, they got hit, New Orleans got hit, and a lot of the people, I think it was like over 40,000 people that had gone to, to Houston, fled to Houston after the whole after, aftermath down there, and then they never went back to New Orleans. So, you know, one city gets destroyed, you just go to another one. So if it's just about a city here, um, well, just 
okay, we'll set up shop in another city. It's not talking about that. It's talking about a financial system that's headquartered and powered out of a certain city. That's what's going on there. Just a little warning about the thing of, uh, you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, the thing of your, uh, put so much stock in the things that you have, your physical wealth. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Very, very true. It doesn't say they that are rich. They that will be rich. The people that are not satisfied with silver. Who, you know, he who loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. It says it back in Ecclesiastes, I believe it is. When you love money, it will mess you up in all kinds of different areas. Let's continue. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You think them people in Revelation 18, you think that they're going to have many sorrows? Yeah. Everything that they've invested, everything that they've worked so hard for their whole life, all the money that was coming in, one hour, gone. Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. How contrary to the modern world. Jump down to verse 17. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that's what I'm doing right now, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly, all things to enjoy. You know, back, again, centuries ago, you have people with gold, silver, copper coins. Well, are they uncertain? Sure, absolutely. You could be walking along and have them things in a little bag or something like that, and the bag rip and they fall into the river or something and get swept away as you're trying to cross the river. That could happen. Thieves could break through and steal that bag of money. You could hide it someplace and you could have an earthquake and your house comes down and there you can't get to it or mudslide or whatever. It was uncertain. But uh, if the economy went wacky or whatever else, well, I have physical gold and silver. Okay? Uh, the economy, you know, the new economy doesn't recognize the guy's face on here anymore, so we'll just melt the gold coin down and make another gold, whatever. <laughs> you know? It's a little bit more sure. But what about paper money? There have been many, many countries that paper money has become so hyperinflated, it's not worth, I mean, toilet paper is worth more. Literally, I'm not joking. Excuse me. What about digital money? Mm -hmm. And I believe, my theory is, that towards about the middle point, when the you know judgments are really getting bad in the time of Jacob's trouble, and the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple, um, I believe there's going to come a solar flare in that time period somewhere and all the electricity is going to get totally zapped, just boom, knocked out. And it could coincide with some of this stuff that's going on there. Again, I can't say it's just going to be exactly three and a half years in, exactly when he sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped. I don't know. But I do believe at some point in time the Mark of the Beast system is going to completely fail. And, you know, it's going to be a, a total destruction of all technology which means Mark of the Beast system and the whole, all the other stuff goes bye-bye. That could be what's going on here. I don't know. Glad I'm not going to be there. Back to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 20. And again, look at the attitude that a Christian should have here when we see this thing happening. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. We can rejoice. I look forward to it. I can't wait to the day when I get to be up there with the Lord, and we're up there throwing a party when we see the Vatican finally destroyed. I can't wait. Uh, looking forward to that one. You know, 
Oh, but the, the, the human tragedy, Brother Ryan, you know, we should, we should, you know, God's not willing that any should perish. <laughs> you know, I get that thing so many times, did a whole study on it. Uh, you need to read the whole verse. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Will they repent? No, the Catholics aren't going to repent. Will individual Catholics repent and get out of that wicked system? I hope so, for their sake. I really do. I don't hate Catholics. But look at verse 21. This is an interesting thing here. And a mighty, mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone hmm, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Why a millstone compared to a millstone? Matthew chapter 18. Go back to the book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 through 7. It says here, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, like the Vatican does all the time, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't God stop these things? Verse 7. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. I get so sick and tired of these foolish atheists. They come out and they say, why would a loving God, if your God's so good and loving and everything and he's perfect and holy and all this, why does he allow human suffering? Because he said that this is the way it's going to be. First of all, he gives man a free will. Man can make his own decisions. You know, you'd, you'd complain if, if man has a free will and you'd complain if God forced people to do things. You know, they just like to complain, apparently. But the whole thing is, God says exactly what's going to happen. The destruction of the Vatican is coming. Their destruction is written in Scripture, prophesied for the future. So what happens if a Catholic goes into that time period and they get slaughtered? And they die a terrible death? Some big Catholic cathedral comes down and falls on them and their head gets crushed and they're laying there for an hour before, before screaming before they finally die or something like that or whatever else, however the Lord decides to bring that city down. Well, it's with fire. It's, they're burned to death or something, just like ancient Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, just, how, why would a loving God? He told them. He warned them. You talk about love. You know, He sends His Son to die on the cross to pay for their sins. That's not enough, apparently, according to the atheists. That's not enough love. But even so, He writes down what's going to happen in the future tells you exactly what's going to come and you say I don't believe it and it comes and you go this wasn't fair <laughs> okay you know that makes a whole lot of sense God tells you exactly what's going to happen he loved you enough to tell you to write it down and say this is exactly what's going to happen and then you get caught in that bad thing that comes because you wouldn't take heed to his warnings you have no excuse you have no excuse. If you're a Roman Catholic and you continue on and you say, well, I believe the true church is the Catholic church, you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. The book says so. Your days are numbered. Let's go back to Revelation 18. We'll finish up here. Revelation 18. Verses 22 through 24. And the voice of harpers and music, musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For the mer merchants, uh, for thy merchants, excuse me, were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Again, the Roman Catholic Church pr practices sorcery all the time. I mean, you know, what in the world? You get pedophile priests and they're walking around with beautiful robes, nice and clean and pure white and everything else. Sorcery. You go into the, the big cathedrals and stuff and they have these big, huge, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes for these big pipe organs and they're playing this music boom, boom, and stuff like this. I talked to a guy that actually was in a one of the choirs that sang in St. Peter's Basilica at one of the high masses like the Easter Mass or something like that. He was actually there. He was raised Roman Catholic. He was there. He sung there and he said the tonals and all the other mind control things with the music, he said you can just feel the music in you. It just, it's so overwhelmingly powerful you know sorcery that's what it is verse 24 and in her were, was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth only roman catholicism can claim that roman catholicism has a long line of satanic succession <laughs> they try to say apostolic succession but satanic succession that goes the whole way back to the original Babylon with Semiramis and Nimrod right back. They can trace you can trace them the whole way back through. America? Are you kidding me? You know, America's Babylon. Well, if you're a, a some kind of a moron, though, perhaps it is. <laughs> Pretty sad. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 2. Zechariah 13, back to the Old Testament, the Minor Prophets, right near the end of your Old Testament books. Zechariah 13, verse 2. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. There's not going to be any mention of Catholicism in the Millennial Kingdom. Lord says, boom, he wipes it out. It's gone. Islam, wiped out. Buddhism, wiped out. Protestantism, boom, wiped out. Independent Fundamental Baptist, wiped out. All of them. Brahma, Hindu, you know, Taoist, uh, Zoroastrianism, New Age, Fruit Loop, what? Doesn't matter. Gone. One system of faith i should say not so much faith because <laughs> it's going to be they're going to people will see jesus christ in that time but you know what i'm saying religious faith i'm saying it's really going to be something do not foolishly charge the lord and say it's not fair it's not just that uh he's going to do all this horrible stuff in the book of revelation he wrote about it and if you go into that time period it's your fault it's your problem you can get saved today Drop whatever little system that you're part of, be it you know humanistic atheism, uh, communistic atheism, whichever variety you know you believe in, or just you're just a regular fool that just is not tired of the lusts and things of this life. Uh, if you're involved with Islam, you're following a false system. Allah is not God. Okay, he's a moon god. He's a pagan god. Uh, Muhammad was a pervert, just like the Catholics that taught him, and uh, his whole system. And what did Muhammad do for anybody? Oh, he showed us the way. He showed us the truth. Yeah, sure, right. You know, ridiculous system. Um, whatever you're part of, Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the only one that died and was buried and rose again from the dead. His blood can wash away your sins, give you a new start. Well, I'm going to find something else. Or I'm going to. I got to do some. Other. Okay, you're going to go right into that time period. And you're going to face it. Just as simple as that. Well, I just don't think we should have any fear. I just don't think that, you know, you're you're trying to make me scared. I hope I am. I hope I am. I mean, the greatest preacher that ever lived that preached the most on hell was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And when he's telling you, hey, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. You know, better to do that than to go to hell. He wasn't saying the grave. He wasn't saying you get kind of burned up there early on and then that's it. There's no more remember, remembrance of you. No, he's talking about eternal torment in a terrible, terrible place. And you don't have to go there. Well, I'm just not convinced. Okay, okay, okay. You know, I see this thing more and more as time goes by. Well, no, I'm just not convinced. I'm just, you know, I got some things that I need to, you know, kind of sort out, you know, and just kind of, 
some things I'm kind of holding on to, you know, and some things that really mean a lot to me. Toilet paper. Your money's gone. There is no point in trying to hold on to anything in this world. The Bible says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And yet people do it all the time. All the time. They don't hold this blessed book in a high enough regard. They try to ban it. They call it hate literature and things like that. They say, We know better than this old book. No, you don't. No, you don't. And as time goes by, you're going to find out. You're going to find out just how true this book really is. So that is going to be it. Um, going to be getting, trying to get these revelation studies done fairly soon. Uh, we'll see. Um, please keep us in your prayers. And thank you to all those out there that support this ministry. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. So we will see you in the next video.